whatever. Okay. Do, do, do. Gather the predictions and then plot them together. It's a nice looking plot with the good facet wrap on model. You could have added a um, message equals false in this little chunk of code to get rid of this particular oh, okay. thing here, but that's okay. If you wanted it to be there, that's great. Uh -huh. All right, so you can see how the slopes are all the same here, essentially, and then they vary over here. Or the GRE scores. Cool. And here's our conclusion. Significant importance of high school ranking and high GRE scores. Uh, it's college ranking, undergrad, not high school, but that's all right. It was late. <laughs> I get you. And the likelihood of those applicants being admitted into graduate school. What more could you have said if it hadn't been so late? <laughs> um. I think something about how these models are different, right? So, like, you could say there was a significant interaction between rank and GPA, as well as the importance of GPA and rank by themselves. So here, you see that in rank two, the higher your GPA it doesn't increase your odds of getting in, as well as if you're in a rank one school. So I think your table showed that. Yes, so here's GPA rank two versus GPA rank three. That is a at least moderately significant, almost but not quite really. But there was a significant interaction with GRE and GPA. Okay, looks good. All right, here's some others. No name at the top, so I don't, I don't know who this is because I just loaded everything programmatically. Uh, this is somebody else's, which they didn't do. Um, here, I'm seeing a lot of information, but less. That's probably mine. Explanatory text. So I'd like a bit of a setup before we just go right in. What is is DF, you know? Um, I think the way to think of this is imagine that you're producing this report for like your boss at some company, right? Or for collaborators working with you on this science project. Or maybe they're new to the project and you bring them in and you're saying, here's what we know so far. Um, so try to idiot proof things. This is, okay. a, this is a chance for you to kind of like explain and clear plain English, what's happening, um, what they're about to see, kind of set up the data set, that sort of thing. So act Even like they don't know anything. Yeah, definitely. And that's that's also what I'm going to expect on your final projects, because frankly, I don't know anything about the data set that you're going to be using um, unless I helped you get it, right? Um, and anyone who comes to your website to kind of see what sort of analyses you're capable of doing in the past, they won't know anything about the data set. So treat anyone who finds this as fresh pair of eyes that need to know stuff. So a paragraph form is totally fine. Okay, cleaning the data, testing two different models. Again, you know, some explanation as to like what's going into these models. Why are they actually different? Um, why anyone would care. Here's our predicted data. 
and organized by rank. And this is GRE, GPA, and huh. Can you help me understand what's going on with this on the left? So what I tried doing and failed at is I tried comparing or combining the the real data with the predicted data. Okay. Um, but yeah. it didn't work how I thought it was going to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is the, oh, GR, oh, admit, yeah. So this makes sense. And this is actually a good little, like, object lesson into what um, logistic regression is doing, right? So normally we're doing a linear regression. We're trying to, like, find the best fit straight line here or curved, however you kind of set it up. Here, what's the best fit line between true and false? directly in the middle between true and false. <laughs> right, and so that, that doesn't tell us anything. And so we need to find a line that effectively separates these into the effective GRE on getting in or not. And what that winds up being is like a little S curve. So let me, if I can bring this up. Now I've got a picture of it. Right here. Okay. So, so logistic regression is essentially trying to make this S curve that discriminates as best it can between two alternatives. You get some false positives, some false negatives, that kind of thing, but it's okay. So that's the essentially the shape. These got in, these didn't right but it's going to be a pretty wacky s curve in this case all right conclusions okay short and sweet fair enough but i do like the the plain language you use here for the conclusions um this kind of thing can even be brought all the way up to the front of your document and say like here's the background here's the conclusions now let me show you right. somebody else didn't do it somebody else didn't do it somebody else didn't do it all right so this is good we're explaining the cleaning. We didn't really explain the data set in this one. Um, all right, then we're going to make a model. Here's why we're calculating mean square residual values. And then here's our setup for which one we're going to pick based on GPA, GRE, rank, all factors, all factors in their interactions. Um, the way you've got it here, I'm guessing that you had it like cat or print. Is that right, Trevor? Yeah, it's all printed. I couldn't figure out how to print the variables in the regular text, so. Oh, so that would just be like, um, let's save this as desktop whatever dot rmd okay so if you've got it in there um, you could have basically just said outside of your code block
Oh yeah, I forgot the. It looks like you need to load tidyverse, right? Sure do. Uh, were those all the submissions you had right there, or all the ones that you could get? Yep. I think I misnamed mine is the problem. That's fine. I can go and find it. And so by putting the text outside of your code block rather than inside with like um, cat, here's the thing. They'll both get the job done, but one comes out looking like it's a line of code, and the other one looks like an actual bit of text. Okay. In all honesty, I was just lazy, and I didn't want to write five blocks of code to do that. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, don't pull that crap on your final project, though. I want it to look sleek. Right. We're, we're making a professional report here. All right. Do, do, do. Okay, this is nice. Yep, you're explaining why that model sucks. That's good. Okay, we've got the full model here. We're graphing it. Explaining the difference. Yeah, that was an interesting conclusion I took away from this. Even the students who went to a rank one school but got bad grades had a better chance uh, than students who went to rank three or four but got 4.0s. Some of them. So yeah, and then nice conclusions. Excellent. OK, rather than go through hunting for all the rest of these, um, so I guess they're just named something different. Your assignment now is to trade these between each other, give feedback, and to make it better. Right, so you'll have a week to get that done. Um, so I don't care who you trade with. I don't care if you pass them around round robin, but get feedback from somebody on your markdown document, your HTML, and make some changes and make it look nicer. Questions about that? What am I looking for? And that would be, uh, that's assignment 10 or not? No, that's, it's actually still gonna, you, I'm not gonna grade this until you've had a chance to like get some feedback and kind of bring it to its best self. Okay. I'd say for some of these, more titles, uh, more explanation. Yeah, more explanation. Uh, make it more of a report rather than just so much dry code. Um, and definitely kind of up front, just even briefly, just explain what the data set is, you know, kind of like why it was collected, that kind of thing. What's the hypothesis you're working with here? Um, so tell the reader what they're about to see. Maybe and, and show it to them. Make it less messy. Could we like store the table as something and then pull the value we actually care about out of the table? Yeah. It's smaller, more compact. Yeah. Now I was grading exams and I found that a lot of you, um, I guess, didn't make it through all of the exercises in I think it was like week three or four because there was something I was noticing you would calculate a value data empty cars mean empty cars wait where am I so the mean displacement you would calculate that value and say okay, well, it's 230, 
but I want to put that into a sentence. So I, I could save this as main disp. And then I can actually use this paste zero function. Or I can paste text and results together. So I think I tried to comment on everyone's exam about this when I saw it happening. Mean engine displacement for these cars is space. And then the next thing I want to stick there is mean disp. And look at that. It puts it all into a nice little string for me. So you can kind of make use to make use of that as well. Um, I can save this as my string. And then I can just cat my string whenever I want. And there it is without the quotes. I went through that a bit fast. Um, any questions about it? Paste function. I could even do stuff in here like round two. If I only get. Sorry, did you say it was paste zero or? Yeah, that's a zero. Okay. The main function is called paste, but by default, it separates everything by um, tabs. Paste zero separates it by nothing, and so you just kind of leave in an extra space at the end of your sentences. OK, thank you. Yeah, and it turns everything into text character string for you when you paste it together. So I'm pasting this character string with the output of that, and it's turning it into text for me. If I save that little pasted thing, then I can just cat it out and there's the results, even though I spelled mean incorrectly. So it's a neat little trick. What, uh, what does round do in there? Round, I told it round the mean displacement to two decimal points. Mm. So you can see the difference. OK, two decimal points. Uh, there's also SIGNIF for doing significant digits to help you with your chemistry homework. Um, the rounds are usually good. All right. So what lingering questions do you have about assignment nine? The ones I looked at look good. Um, I mean, they need some work to various degrees, getting them cleaned up and everything, but you'll have, you've got time for that, especially once you have feedback from somebody. I have a question. Great. How would we decide or recognize that we need to set things as, um, what, what did I do in there? It was something that I said I, as true. Like with, with our, um, our zero one thing, is it just whenever you have something that's either true or false, you need to go in there and change it? Um, stuff like that. How do I just recognize intuitively like, oh, this needs to be set as a factor and it's not. Oh, this needs to be. You have to know something about the data to do that appropriately. And so. In the case of empty cars, you have to know that you can't have one. 1.14 cylinders in an engine, right? They come in discrete units. Um, and so treat it like a factor. Um, maybe an ordered factor, but still a factor. Um, admit being zero and one. If you look at my introduction to that data set, I tell you that those mean whether you did not or did get in. That's a true false. So it just kind of comes with thinking about it a bit. There's no magic bullet. Uh, I, I see analyses from time to time where something that should have been treated like a factor wasn't. 
and it kind of messes up the results. And so people have to go back and change it to a factor and redo it, right? Um, so you're never going to be perfect at it all the time, but this comes down to the you thinking about the data before you go in and try to analyze it. Like what data was actually collected here? What format should it be in? It's part of the, the cleaning process. I don't know if that helps or if I just punted. Um, I mean, kind of. I mean, the cleaning part is pretty much the bulk of the work. And so yeah. it's like how to clean effectively. I know we've kind of gone over that, right? But A little bit. Right. We're going to do more. Um, that's actually on the docket for what's next today is a live cleaning demonstration from some pretty messy data that I haven't seen in about two years. I've cleaned it before, but I've forgotten everything about it. I have a question too, if we're okay. ready to move on there. Um, I don't know if any of you guys tried to do this. I was just uh, messing around with this assignment nine and I was gonna throw in a link. Mm. Just random link just to try it out but it kept it was giving me an error and it said unexpected and then it just had the box uh parentheses things can't think of the exact name of those right now sure um is am i missing a library or something if that's happening no let me show you you do it outside of your r chunk i'm guessing that you were trying it in here yes yeah okay it's got to be done outside so um, you put it in the square brackets, link, and then here you put the link. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to open in a new tab, you put little curly brackets and say target equals blank, like so. All right, anyone else? All right, I'm going to open project in a new session. Desktop, data course is on. Okay. I'm going to do this since it's going to be really ugly and messy. I'm going to skip the markdown for right now and just do it in a script like normal. And this is cleaning the bird data set. So packages. I always, always want my Tidyverse for cleaning. My data set. Read CSV and it is in data bird measurements dot CSV. It's a lot of columns. 37 variables, 3,769 observations. This is just going to be easier if we look at it. All right. <clears throat> so we've got family, species number, whatever that means, species name, the common name, M mass, M mass N. F mass, F mass N, unsexed mass, unsexed mass N, M wing, F wing, unsexed wing, M tarsus, F tarsus, unsexed tarsus, M bills and F bills and unsexed bills and then tails, and then we've got clutch size, egg mass, and mating system. Okay. 
So we got total mass for the bird, its wing measurement, tarsus measurement, bill, tail, and then we've got clutch size, egg mass, and mating system. All right, somebody tell me the first thing that's wrong with this data set. Can't you make a variable that's gender? We really, they really need to do that, yeah. So we've got it spread out here with M, F, and unsexed. So we need to make a, a gender for that. What else? Do you want to switch it to long format? Well, that'll get us, when we make a, a gender slash sex um, column, that'll put it longer for sure. What does the N mean? The, so it's mass N and then later on it has like wing N or just mass? I don't know. I'm guessing it's the number of observations that that was taken from. So I'm thinking that this is an average value out of 26 females that they measured the mass. But I'm not sure. So another thing, we've got mass, wing, tarsus. That's another, yeah, another variable that's spread out across columns and needs to be made longer. So let's try this. I'm gonna, just so I have a list of these to look at, we've got names DF, okay. Make sex category column. How do I go from wide to long? Pivot longer. Pivot longer. The data is DF. The columns equals which ones do I actually want to pivot? longer based on sex. Would you just do the species name? So you have species name male, species name female? Okay. But I mean, which which um, columns should I basically start stacking on top of each other? Uh, the male and female for every one of these measurements, like for the mass, male and female should probably be in one. Okay, let's try. Let's try everything right now. I'm going to say all columns. And we got, what, 37? So let's just do it the easy way. Calls 1 through 37. Oops. Then we've got names to What should the names be? measurement. What do we want to call our values? Value. Oops. Hmm. Can't combine family double and species name character. So what's happening? You have a numeric and a string data type that you're trying to put in one column. Yeah, family here. 
numeric character. So it's like trying to combine family and species name, and it does not know how. So I need to basically leave out these first four. So I'm going to change that to 5 through 37. OK. So let's see here. Now we've got a measurement. We've got male mass. Hmm. What to do? So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, I'm afraid we're going to have to do a number of pivot longers, maybe one for each of the different measurement types. So maybe we just are going to have to go in here and get all the ones that have mass in them. So let's try this. Contains mass. We'll call that DF2. Then let's take a look at it. We're down to 32 variables. Okay, so here we've got measurement is mass. But we're going to run out pretty soon. There's going to be a bunch of NA values, yeah. Okay. Are we making progress or am I going down the wrong path here? I trust your judgment. I could be deliberately leading you astray. I think you should get rid of the NA values before you do anything. Could, mm. Couldn't you add another parameter to this that says NA equals RM or something like that or NA to RM? How are you going to remove them from the middle of a, a data frame, though? Does that make any sense? Like, how do you take this out? What would you replace it with? You replace it with a zero, but I don't know if that would mess up the data. Ooh, yeah, that's that's lying right there. A zero means that you measured the mass and it weighs zero grams. But couldn't you then say, hey, get rid of all, or ignore all zeros? Why would you want to? Because they're NAs. You know what NA means? Not applicable, nothing there. Ignore this. Yep. NAs are great. We, we want those there. They are very different from a zero. They're treated differently than zeros. OK, so let's think here. DF2, that gives us measurement and value. OK, maybe we're onto something. We've got measurement and value. Um, but maybe we should pull out the male, female stuff first. Male, female, and unsexed. So let's try something kind of weird. Let's say DF select starts with M underscore. So that's just going to give us a bunch of the male stuff. Okay. Well, I think we also want the first four columns as well. So I'm going to concatenate those together. I'm going to call this male. A 
we'll make a subset for female and then one for unsexed. Whoops, that's a capital F, right? Okay, male, female, and unsexed. But then we're actually losing these last three clutch size, egg mass, and mating system. So that's columns 35, 36, and 37. So I'm going to tack those on as well. Okay, so here's all the stuff for females. Now this should be a bit easier to tidy up and then we can stick it back together. All right. So let's do mass. Female mass. F and N. What is that N? Did anyone have a good guess? They're not consistent across. It's not like they measured Hmm. They're always whole numbers. I'm going to take them all out. I don't like them. So way up here when I'm reading in the data, I'm going to say select not starts with or ends with. So I'm going to select everything that doesn't end with an error. Can't subset columns that don't exist. Oh, now I've gone and screwed it up. What happened? You shifted your columns over, didn't you? So you I don't sure have 37. Did. Yeah, DF doesn't have 37 columns anymore. Okay, so we want one, two, three, four, but then the last ones are 20, 21, and 22. I'm going to highlight that, copy it, and do Control F. I'm just going to find and replace with 20 through 22. Place all, done, OK. All right, so now let's take a look at female. Family species number, clutch size, egg mass, mating system, and then we've got mass of wing, tarsus, bill, tail. Neat. How do I get rid of the F underscore from all those? Isn't there a rename starts with F underscore? Yeah, we could do that. We could do a string replace or like a string remove. Or let's see here. Female. We're going to pivot that longer. And the ones we select are all going to be the F underscore. We're going to pivot. Starts with F underscore. Okay. Then our uh, names two should be measurement. 
our values two should be value. And then there's that names prefix. Right. Names prefix F underscore. So let's take a look at this. Clutch size, egg mass, measurement. Now we're getting somewhere. So for the females, we've got whether it's the overall mass, the wing, the tarsus, bill, the tail, and then the value for each of these birds repeated over and over. That's awesome. Okay. The bit of code that got us there from female was this right here. So I'm actually going to just copy that or excise it and tack it on up here. See if I can make this more readable. Starts with F, names. All right, so female will be DF. We're going to select those columns, anything that starts with F. Then we're going to pivot longer. All the ones that starts with F, we're going to change the names to measurement, the values to value, and then take off the little F underscore. OK. So all we got to do is copy and paste that to each one of these and then change the F to M. And then the F to unsexed. Now, how do we stick these together? Full join. We could do a full join. Um, we just tell it, like, here's the columns to join on. Don't you want to mutate another column to show sex before you join on, though? Thank you. I was going to mess it up, and you screwed it. All right, I was going to make it not work. But yes, we do need another column to be able to tell them apart once we get them on there. OK, so what's that going to look like? We're going to add a mutate sex equals unsexed. Okay. Control Alt B runs everything again, and then now let's look at female. Sex female. I can actually just stick these all on top of each other. R bind binds things as rows, so it's going to stack them on top of each other. Female, male, and on sext. Oh, that's capitalized. And we'll call that full. Let's take a look at it. We got family, 
species number, species name, English name, clutch size, egg mass, mating system, measurement, value, and sex. And it's clean. Well, it's at least in the right format. Okay. So let's ggplot for aesthetics. X equals family. English name. There's a bunch of these things on here. Let's go with family so it's not too cluttered. Is it capitalized? I don't remember. Yep. Y equals value plus geome. Box plot plus facet wrap on measurement. Mm, boy, that was really great. What's wrong? In one of the unsexed columns, it's not capitalized, the U. I don't know if that causes an issue, but so they probably didn't get separated. Really? I didn't notice that. So straight from the original data frame then. Yeah, if you look at unsexed mass, it's not capitalized, so it's different than the other ones. Oh. oh, okay. Good find. How do I fix that? Mutate it before you. Yeah. Let's see here. Look way up at the top. We look at that. Okay, there it is. Unsex maps. So I'm going to copy that. Which ones of those are equal to unsex mass? There it is. So I'm going to say names of DF and then put that in square brackets. The ones of those that are unsex mass, and I'm just going to say that is now. Sex mass. And I'm going to go all the way through, run everything again with Control Alt B, and there we go. But I did fix one problem. I mean, it just looks horrible. Why? Uh, all the dots are too close together to tell what's going on, even when you scaled it. What if I did factor family? It's going to take a bit longer. What's different? It's an ink blot test now. Yeah, <laughs> it's still a hideous graph. Um, but now we're actually comparing the families. They were stored as numeric because it was like one through seven or twenty or whatever. I just realized though that our unsexed, I've got them all as under like lowercase. Those need to be all uppercase now.
Control Alt B, run everything again. Error, object unsexed, not found. Oh yeah, because that's capitalized. All right. So that should clean it up a bit. Now we're talking bill, mass, tail, wing, tarsus. We're getting a kind of rundown of the different families. That's a bunch of different families, but okay. So maybe instead of having to keep remembering that family is a factor over and over, up here I can say convert family to factor. DF family is factor DF family. These others need help. Mating system. Yeah, that's stored as numeric. So I can say that one is factor. Mating system. OK, and then I don't have to worry about this. So this might be a little Oops. bit much, but can we also facet wrap each family? Yeah, that would be uh, too many. <laughs> OK, because thinking I'm, if you show I'm afraid it would. It would shut down R right now, but <laughs> yeah, we could, we could do that. I've got another R project running in the background right now. My computer won't be able to handle it. Um, OK, so family in. One, two, three, four, five. So we're going to filter to where the family is just those first five, I guess. Heck, how many are there? Most of them aren't in the first five. So we'll say in 11 and 12 and 13, and then four and five. Why not? OK. So run everything. And there we go. OK, so now we're actually starting to get somewhere with our data. We can start playing with it. Um, what I wanted you to see was this process right here of we actually needed to pull apart our data frame into a few chunks, right? The males, then the females, and the unsex. Then we could collapse all of those and then stick them back together. So this was a bit of a trickier data cleaning. I think I did it entirely differently last time that I cleaned this, um, like a year ago, um, but got the same result. So there's not going to be one way. I think I like this better than however that it took less time this time. So the point of this was not for you to memorize how to clean the bird data. All right. The point of this was to kind of see me struggle a little bit and with some feedback and looking at things, find some new errors, go back, restart, and kind of iteratively figure out how to clean this thing. In the end, it wasn't like we needed to type a whole bunch of code manually. Once we figured it out for male, it's the exact same thing for female and unsexed, right? Well, except for the weird capitalization issue. Right? So maybe at this point, we know we got our code working, so we can go back and look for more tricky capitalization. Now I put up the package of the week two weeks ago was janitor 
make clean names. Where it's going to get rid of all capitalization. It's going to turn any spaces or periods into underscores. It's going to get rid of any trailing or leading white space. Okay, so uh -huh. we could use that to make clean names to start with so that we know everything's lowercase. Probably should have done that, but I forgot about it. Would that have saved you eight hours on Friday? Nothing could have saved me from how stupid I was. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it wound up being 12 hours um, on Sunday, yesterday, that I was dealing with this because I screwed myself over so badly. I had sample.names as something and also sample names. And I was like, oh, I'll just definitely remember that sample.names refers to the previous version and sample names refers to this new one and I didn't I didn't remember that like five minutes later and since sample dot names was also in my environment it didn't return an error it just gave me the wrong answer so be careful some of you like to get cheeky in your exams um, and have like ridiculous object names I've noticed that's fine, but it will bite you. So try to name things meaningfully. You know, like here, mail refers to, hey, it's just the mail stuff. Uh, I wouldn't want to have called this like coffee mug, right? So keep that in mind. All right, any questions about what you saw here? Um, either technical or kind of big picture how to go about cleaning a new data set question yeah let's say you add hmm. let me rephrase this i have two data frames okay okay they have some similarities but some differences in the columns how do i take selected columns from one data frame and just attach those to the end of the other data frame. Hmm. So let's see here. Library. Yeah. So in the car data package, we get two data sets MPLS stops do we have to say tibble yeah okay and MPLS demo so let's take a look at these so this is Minneapolis police stops um, for the entire year. Oops. We've got names, MPLS stops, and names, MPLS demo. So essentially, we've got, here's the stop, the, the date it happened, what the problem was, MDC, whether citation was issued, the whether vehicle search was done, person search, Latin long, the police precinct, and the neighborhood that it happened in. Totally separate data set over here with different numbers of rows, has neighborhood population, percent white, black, foreign born, household income, poverty levels, and college graduation rates. So what I think you're asking is, like, how do I combine these two if there's some shared information between them? Yeah, right? let's, but, oh. let's say um, police precinct happen to have, because you have to have the same number of rows, right, to 
throw it on there. You don't. Otherwise, it'll you don't. Okay, so let's say we just want police precinct and race, and we just want to throw that onto the other one. Okay. They have to have at least one column that's shared. So here we've got neighborhood and neighborhood. So we know the neighborhood where this all happened. And then here we know things about that neighborhood, essentially. So we, if you want to throw in, we got to throw the, the smaller one onto the bigger one. So let's try this. Full join. And we're going to join MPLS stops and MPLS demo. And we're going to join them by neighborhood. Oops. By equals neighborhood. And I'll call that full MPLS. Problem with neighborhood. Oh, I see the problem. Do you see it? I capitalize an N. Okay. So now here's full. Full MPLS. So now for every row in ID number, we have all the information from that neighborhood also. So that full join will just stick everything together. So here we know about a stop, and then we know the neighborhood, the population, percentage of white, black, foreign born, household income, poverty. And, and you can see that it's just repeated over and over for every neighborhood, downtown west, those values are gonna be the same. Okay. So the full join will replicate rows based on the shared column. And so now if you just wanted those other ones, you just rip them off, right? So we say full MPLS and then select and just pick the columns that you want. We can say names of full MPLS and which ones do we want? One through 15, I think you said. And then what did you say? Just household income and. Yeah, just pick any two. Okay. okay. Yeah. 16. 18. So here. We just did population percentage of white people and percentage of foreign born. So we're sticking them together that way on our little website it's back up here because we didn't go into it in a lesson right here in week seven is visual explanation of joins this is super handy just scroll down here all right so you've got x and y it's going to show you two data frames and how they join together so here's inner join going to find all the ones that have corresponding rows. Keep the ones on the inside. Left join. It's going to keep everything on the left plus the stuff on the right that came in with it and put an NA where it didn't belong. Okay, so here's a left join if you go from a bigger to a smaller one. The right join is just the opposite. And then full join. This is what we just did where it'll start duplicating values for you if it needs to. Okay, and then there's all these filtering joins as well. Anti-join, I've never used that one, but okay. So that's pretty handy, and those all come with dplyr also, so if you load tidyverse, you've got access to them. Um, the one I find most handy is almost always Full join and then just removing stuff that I don't want. But we are out of time and we'll pick up here on Wednesday and take some more time to talk about final projects and kind of get them set up. Because you're right, cleaning is going to be the biggest part.
All right. I'll see you guys Wednesday. All right. Thank you.